Good morning. My name is Heather, and um, I'm just so glad that I get to be here and worship with you this morning. If if you're joining us on YouTube, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. It's the bell icon so that you don't miss out on anything that we've got going on on this channel. I also want to invite you to go to thevillagenashville.com slash live, um, where you can learn more about who we are and why our mission is to be a church for the community. And you can share a little bit about you because we want to get to know who you are and get to know your story. We're, we're gathering in worship this morning, and I know that that might look different for us um, or different than we want it to look. You might be uh, sitting in your break room at work, sharing this with friends or doing it by yourself. It might be in your living room with your family or possibly outside of a neighbor's house in their backyard for a gathering. Whatever that looks like, whatever that is for you, um, know that when we gather and worship together, powerful things can happen and get it. God is absolutely in the midst of it all. Um, so with that in mind, I want to invite you to, to push all of that aside, all the distractions aside, the, the temptation maybe to multitask. Um, I know I can be tempted to multitask and check that text message that comes in or shoot that quick email out, but um, let's push all of that aside and be as present as we can be. And I know it might feel weird in the beginning, but when we sing, sing with us. Even if you are outside by yourself, or in your break room, go ahead and sing with us. Pray with us when we when we pray with you, um, and know and know that God is with you, and that we are with you in that very moment that you're doing the same thing. Um, so, with that in mind, I want to pray for us and and get us into worship this morning, so that we can we can be a part of that together. Will you all pray with me? God, we come to you with open and humble hearts this morning full of gratitude that we get to worship together in whatever form that looks like. God, I pray for us to all have open hearts and open minds um, and to be fully present on you in this moment so that we can hear the words and the message that you want us to hear this morning. And God, I'm praying this more and more every day, but God, help me to hear you, help me to hear your voice and to take your message out in the world so that I can be the person and the child you want me to be. And God, I pray that for the people who are sitting in the living room this morning or in the break room this morning. God, help us to be your children, to hear your message this morning and to live that out in big, bold ways out in our community. God, we love you. We are grateful for you. Amen. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb. Till I met you I was breathing But not alive And all my failures I tried to hide It was my tomb
sin was heavy, the chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, and you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was brought The scripture reading for today is Deuteronomy 6, 1 to 12. These are the commands. Decrees and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you and so that you may enjoy a long life. Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey, so that it may go well with you, and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give today are always to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, and when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them as symbols to your hands and bind them to your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. When the Lord your God brings you into the land he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large flourishing cities you did not build, houses with all kinds of good things that you did not provide, wells that you didn't dig, and vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. Then when you eat, and are satisfied. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Hello, my name is Mike Walsh. One, one of the, uh, the, the real personal and important moments in, in my life, prayer-wise, has, has really evolved uh, out of my participation in and involvement with the village. We, we've been worshiping at sunset and we all have known for some time that we needed to uh, have, a, have a place to, to worship and build a building of our own. And I was on the land team at that time to try to help secure some land to build a church. And, and we had looked at a variety of parcels of land and had really centered on one on, on Burkett Road. Um, we knew we needed to have some frontage and a presence on a major road, but there just wasn't anything available on Nolansville Road. So we looked in the area and we found a, found a place on uh, Burkett Road uh, that, that really filled the bill and it would allow us to, to do what we needed to do with the village. And we pretty well centered on that. And on January 6th, which is Epiphany, Travis um, wanted the, the land team to get out and walk the land and as it turned out his devotion that day was from Genesis where it says, go out, walk the land and I will give it to you. Um, and that day a snowstorm came um, and it made getting there difficult. I was on my way back 
towards uh, this property on Old Burkett Road, and I was, I was going to walk it because that's, I, I felt like that was a real responsibility that I had to do that day. And as hard as I tried, I couldn't get there. And and so, the best thing I could do was pull off on Old Burkett and get to the those cement barriers at the property that we now have, and I parked there and I walked up the hill, and I was just praying for God to reveal to us, not to me, but to us, what, what it was that he had in store for us. What, what, what was his plan? The lady that owned the property was just never comfortable selling it. And we kept trying to buy it. And she was just never comfortable. And I, I don't know that any of us really were properly attentive to the fact that God was putting up a stop sign that that's not where you need to go. And, and in some ways I've, I've looked back and I wonder if uh, all of those roadblocks and the snowstorm and everything else to keep us away from Miss Cromer's property was really the answer that we had been praying for was that's not the property that, that you need to have and need to focus on. Well, I park at Old Burkett, I walk up the hill, a couple game trails and um, I got up there on top of the hill and. Quite frankly, I got a little disoriented. The, the sun wasn't out, it was still cloudy. I could hear noise from the roads. In, in hindsight, the, the area that I walked because I got disoriented, now I would say that God was guiding me, uh, is really the whole area that has blown up. There's a whole variety of options that are coming um, open and available to us that, that really we did not know about and, and would not have been available to us had we gone with the property on Burkett Road. There is not a doubt in my mind that God is guiding us and God is leading us to where we are today. Um, yeah, it's not going to be easy, but I, I, I'm 100% confident that, uh, that where we're putting the church is where we're supposed to put the church. I was, I was trying as hard as I could try to get to the property on Burkett Road, and it didn't happen. And where I got is where I should have got, and I, I didn't fully appreciate that at the time. But in hindsight, I know that God got me where I needed to go. Well, hey, good morning. My name is Travis. I'm one of the pastors here at The Village. And I'm so glad that you're with us today. I want to thank Mike for sharing your story with us. We have been so fortunate from the beginning to have wise and faithful leaders like Mike guiding our church. Well, it's an exciting day for us as a church, and it's unbelievable to me that we're here. We're, we're breaking ground today on our building, and we're making the preparations that are necessary so that we can... We can pour the foundation of what's going to sit on our property for years to come, and, and it's going to be something that's, that's going to outlast us. In the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 6, Moses is speaking to the people of Israel about their land, about their property, and this is what he says. He says, these are the commands and the laws and the decrees which the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess so that you, your children, and their children after them may, may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. The people of Israel, they're about to break ground on their property, essentially, and, and Moses says, hey, I'm going to tell you something that's, that's the foundation of everything we do and everything we are, and it's something that, that if we don't get it right, we run the risk of missing everything. This, this is the most important thing that you need to know. This is the most important thing that you need to do. This is for you and it's for your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren and everybody after them that you'll ever meet, but, but they'll be deeply impacted by who you are and what you do and whether or not you get this one thing right. No, no pressure, right? And I kind of want to be like, well, well, that's just great in Deuteronomy, but, but where's Moses in 2020? I mean, where are you, Moses? Would you mind telling me the one thing that I need to know and the one thing that I need to do? Well, here's what he says in Deuteronomy 6.4. It's some of the most central words in the entire Bible. And, and it's words that, 
that he said then, and I think it's words that absolutely he would say now, and here they are, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And, and these words were so important that Jesus himself was out teaching one day, and, and some people approached him and they said, Teacher, what's the greatest commandment in all of the law? And this is the verse he quoted. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Love God, love your neighbor. I mean, that's easy enough, right? Well, the most well-known verse in the entire Bible is on the same topic. And it's it's possible that you've heard what it says so many times that you you just dismiss it or completely miss out on its absurdity. It, it's an absurd verse if you stop and think about what it means. John 3.16, 3, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And I want to I stop just on those first six words. For God so loved the world. I mean, have you ever stopped to think about how absurd that is? I mean, God, who's the one who said, who said, let there be light and the universe exploded into being and, and the one who made the stars and the planets and the galaxies and the mountains and the oceans so loved the world. I mean, what does that really mean? What are the implications of the fact that God so loves the world? I mean, Jesus says that the greatest commandment is to love God with your whole heart and your, your soul and your mind. But before you do that, you've got to consider and come to grips with the fact that God so loves you. Have you ever so loved something or so loved someone? I feel like I need to have a confessional moment here. I, I need to tell you all about my first love. I mean, the ultimate love of my life is clearly my wife, Amanda, but but I need to confess to you today that she was not my first love. You see, when I was a kid, I so loved Alyssa Milano. And I realize some of you are probably asking, who's Alyssa Milano? Or I'm sure some people are probably offended because you don't like Alyssa Milano because, you know, it's 2020 and people have to find something to be upset about. But none of these things change the fact that when I was a kid, I so loved her. She was on a show called Who's the Boss? And, and that question was really about two other characters on the show, but to me, Alyssa Milano was the boss. I mean, she was the boss. I so loved her. Now, I, I had an age-appropriate Alyssa Milano poster on the wall in my room, and, and she was just smiling at me all the time. I mean, she just looked at me, and she smiled, and I just looked at her, and I smiled because I so loved her. And, and, and this was before the internet, so my two options to see the absolute love of my life were look at my poster and wait for Who's the Boss to come onto the TV once a week. And, and then, of course, to, to dream about her in my imagination, to, to think about what our family would be like and, and where we would live and if my parents would come visit us in Hollywood at our mansion and, and, I, and that I'd stay home with the kids so that she could keep making her millions and how we'd sometimes get to have dinner with Tony Danza. And, and I was convinced that, that even though I was a younger man, I was in fourth grade, and I think she was probably like a junior in high school, that, that when we met, she would be able to see past something that minor, and, and she would wait for me. And I, and I knew that once she saw my spiked hair and my darkly tinted glasses, and, and once I was able to declare my love for her, she would wait for me, and we would get married, and, and I'd even be willing to change my last name to Milano so as not to disrupt her career. And no one ever really had the heart to take me aside and tell me the truth. Like, hey, buddy, cute poster. You probably need to work on the hair. I need to tell you something. She has no idea who you are. But I, but I love her so much. I so love her. Yeah, she doesn't know you're alive. Yeah, but if we could only meet and I could declare my feelings for her. Yeah, um, she will never even give you the time of day. Yeah, but when I see her, I get I get butterflies in my stomach and, and my cheeks get hot and I love her, I love her, I love her. Yeah, but you're obsessing about somebody who will never, ever know that you even exist. I mean, she will never in her life think about you a single time ever. I, I so loved Alyssa Milano. 
Well, John says God so loves the world. The whole world. I mean, think about the absurdity of that. All the people in the world, every human being who's ever lived on the planet and, and every human being who will ever live on the planet, the good people and the bad people and all the people in between, and you'd maybe think God would set a more realistic goal. And, and I wonder if anybody's ever had that conversation with God. I mean, has anybody ever had the heart to pull God aside and have a real conversation about this? Hey, buddy, I, I need to tell you something. Most of them have no idea who you are, but I love them so much. I so love them. Yeah, about that. Um, they don't even know you're alive. But if we could only meet and I could declare my feelings for them, God might say back. And uh, yeah, but, but they'll probably never even give you the time of day. God says, yeah, but when I see them, I get, I get butterflies in my stomach and my cheeks get hot and I love them, I love them, I love them. <laughs> and somebody might say, you, you're obsessing about people who will never, ever know that you even exist. I mean, they will, they will never in their lives think about you a single time ever. But listen to this. You see, over and over and over again, we see that God's love for us can never be deterred by our lack of love for him. God's love isn't dependent on your reciprocation of that love. And, and, and even more than I so loved Alyssa Milano, which was about as much as a fourth grade boy can, can so love anything or anyone, even more than that, God so loves you. God dreams about you in his imagination. I mean, his, his eyes light up every time he sees you. I get to officiate a lot of weddings, and, and the moment that gets me every time is the moment when, when the doors at the back of the church open up, and the, the music starts playing, and the bride comes into view, and I usually lean over to the groom, and I say something like, hey, don't run. Okay, no, no, that's not what I say. Usually I say, I say something like, soak it in, because you will never get this view again. And, and I love that moment, but I, I don't love that moment because I'm looking at the bride, although the bride always looks stunning. I love that moment because I'm looking at the groom. I love seeing the way the groom's face lights up the first moment that the bride comes into view. And it gets me every time because in that moment, I see a glimpse of the face of God. I mean, if you, if you ever look at the groom's face at that point in a wedding, you see a glimpse of the face of God because the Bible says that the church is like a bride and God is like a groom, which means that when God sees you, God's face lights up like a groom standing at the front of the church on his wedding day. See, all throughout the Bible, we're given this command, love the Lord your God with all your heart. You find it something like seven times in the book of Deuteronomy, and Moses just repeats it over and over again in his final words to the people of Israel. In the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all record Jesus himself quoting this verse and saying that it's the most important commandment. But here's what I think we've got to understand about that. The command to love God isn't from a narcissistic monster who just sits around and expects us to do whatever he says or, or who one-sidedly demands our affection. The command to love God is from someone who's gone to every possible length, including sending his own son to demonstrate his love for us. The Apostle Paul writes this in the book of Romans. Maybe you've heard this before. He says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly, and, and very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But then he says this, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And then in his first letter in the New Testament, a letter conveniently called 1 John, John, the disciple of Jesus, he writes this, he says, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And I want to stop right here for a second because I believe that there are people who deeply need to hear this. And I want to make sure that you hear this. I spoke with a neighbor of mine this week who told me that, that he was convinced that he was going to hell. 
He, he told me that he was convinced that he'd, been, he'd done too many horrible things for God to love him. And I know that maybe you feel like that. I mean, maybe you feel like you've made too many mistakes. Maybe maybe you feel like you've made too many poor choices. Maybe you feel like you've taken your life down a dead-end path one too many times. And in the process, you've taken yourself outside of the scope of the love of God. And, and I can understand how you might feel that way, but that's just not how the story goes from God's perspective. God's so love for you doesn't have limitations. The Apostle Paul writes in the book of Romans, he says, I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here's the deal. Jesus knew everything that you would ever do in all the ways that you would ever turn your back on him and all the times you would royally mess it up and he already died for you anyway. That's what God's so love for you looks like. God so loves the world. God so loves you. There's nothing you can do to take that back. There's nothing you can do to mess that up. And, and you might notice as you begin to realize that God so loves you. I mean, when you begin to realize the depth of God's love for you, when you begin to understand that, there's, there's nothing that God wouldn't do for you. There's, there's nowhere that God wouldn't go to bring you back. Something starts to happen to you. Something, something starts to grow in you. And at that point, you begin to recognize that there's more to the story. God so loves you. I mean, that's that's crucially important to understand, but that's only the first half of the story of the gospel. There's more to the story, and, and, and it's critically important that we don't stop at the halfway point because the first half will absolutely, it will change your life and it will change your heart, but the second half has the power to change the world. Now, it's interesting, there are only two places in the Bible where that phrase is used, so loved. The first is, of course, John 3, 16, that we've already talked about. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. But the second is 1 John 4, 11, where, where John writes, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. John goes on and he writes more about what he means by this. He says this, dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit and we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in him. And so we know and rely on the love that God has for us. God is love. John goes on. So we know and rely on the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. And this is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. Listen to that again. Don't miss that. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. Jesus, N.T. Wright, who's a British pastor and a biblical scholar, he says this about that. He says, the Christian faith grows directly out of and must directly express the belief that in Jesus, the Messiah, the one true God has revealed himself to be love incarnate. And those who hold this faith and embrace it as the means of their own hope in life, they must themselves reveal the self-same fact before the watching world. Love incarnate must be the badge that the Christian community wears, the sign not only of who they are, but of who their God is. And then he goes on to say, the rule of love is not an optional extra. It is of the very essence of what we are about. Standing at the foot of the cross, gazing on the length to which God's love has gone for us, it's impossible not to sense the power and possibilities within that love. 
This is the force that has changed the world and it could still change the world if only the followers of Jesus would really come on board with it. In other words, nobody in the world gets to experience John 3.16 unless you and I live out 1 John 4.17. The way that people experience the saving love of God is through people who in this world are like Jesus. The way that the people in this world will experience the saving love of Jesus is through people who in this world are like Jesus. And here's what we know about Jesus and the love of Jesus. Jesus had a multi-directional love. I mean, if we're going to be like Jesus, we've got to have that same kind of multi-directional love. If we want the people around us to experience the love of Jesus, we've got to have that same kind of multi-directional love. Jesus loved the one who was above him. I mean, Jesus was clearly devoted to God in in heart, mind, soul, and strength. And if you want to have that same kind of multi-directional love that Jesus had, you first got to cultivate your connection and your devotion to God because The deal is the more you grow in your love for God, the more your capacity grows to love other people. Jesus also loved those who were below him and those who were beside him. And and although Jesus could have absolutely prayed or played the the trump card of self-importance, he continually humbled himself. And so when people come in contact with you, are they coming in contact with the love of Jesus? Because if you love the Lord with all your heart, it will be evident in all your life. And if it's not evident in all your life, it's not yet love with all your heart. I mean, and so how do you treat the people who are part of your daily life? How often are you angry or irritable with them? I mean, how do you deal with your family members when they disappoint you? How do you, how do you treat your coworkers or your employees or your teachers? How do you entreat the how do you treat the employees of businesses who keep messing up in their service? And then maybe most importantly in a divided time like this and in the lead up to a contentious election in a a time of such sharp animosity among people, Jesus loved those who were against him. Jesus said it's easy to love your friends, it's easy to love the people who love you, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus, while he was hanging on the cross, he prayed for the people who nailed him there. He said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. In an election season, if you're a Republican, it's easy to love Republicans, but Jesus said you should love the Democrats. If you're a Democrat, it's easy to pray for Democrats, but Jesus said you should pray for the Republicans and don't just pray for them to lose. You should actually pray for them as human beings. Jesus had a multi-directional love. He loved the one above him. He loved those who were below him and beside him. And most importantly, he loved those who were against him. One more thing. One more thing. I was I was with a group of pastors, uh, pastors that I really respect and, and look up to who are leading just incredible and influential churches. And, and someone asked the question, what was the first thing that you read? That was, that was really influential to you in your spiritual life. The, the first thing that, that kind of really lit you up as a follower of Jesus. And all these pastors, they're answering with the names of spiritual giants and spiritual classics and, and things like that. You know, C.S. Lewis, Dallas Willard, A.W. Tozer, Billy Graham, Richard Foster. I mean, all these amazingly deep spiritual writers. I mean, and did I mention that these are people that I've looked up to for a long time? And so, It gets to be my turn, and the only thing I can think to say in that moment is chicken soup for the soul. The most impactful work on my development as a young follower of Jesus was chicken soup for the soul. I don't care. There's an old story in chicken soup for the soul, one that maybe you've heard, one that probably I've told. It's one of my favorite stories that I read when I was younger. It's about a holy man who has a chance to meet with the Lord. And he says, Lord, will you show me the difference between heaven and hell? The Lord agrees to do it. And so he takes the holy man into this room that's got a large table in the, in the middle with, with people sitting all the way around the table. And, and the people in this room are famished and they are, are miserable. And in the table, in the middle of the table is this pot of stew and and it smells so good that the holy man's mouth begins to water. And every person in the room has a spoon with the handle fastened to their hand, but the, but the spoon is long enough that they can reach the stew in the middle of the table. 
but it's so long, it's longer than they ar their arms, and so they're, they're unable to get the stew back into their mouths. And so they watch the scene for a few minutes, and then the Lord leads the holy man outside the room, and he says to him, you've seen hell. Well, next the Lord takes the holy man into another room that he perceives to be heaven, but, but surprisingly, the room has the same exact setup. I mean, it's people sitting in a circle around a table, holding a pot of uh, the table's holding a pot of stew that smells so good that the, the holy man's mouth begins to water, all of them with the same long-handled spoons attached to their hands, only there, everyone is sitting in the circle. It is, is they're well-fed, they're, they're laughing, and they're talking with, another, with one another. And, and the holy man says to the Lord, Lord, what's the difference? And the Lord says back to the holy man, he says, the difference is simple. Here, they've learned to feed each other. Listen, we've all received the love of God. It's been given to us freely. It's a gift that's sitting right in front of us. The question is, what are we going to do with it? Because the danger in a time like this is that we'll spend a lot more time trying to feed ourselves or pointing out how other people aren't like Jesus than we will trying to be like Jesus ourselves. But God so loved the world. God so loves you, and if God so loves you, and if God so loves us, we also ought to love one another. And if we're going to be like Jesus, we've got to have that same kind of multi-directional love that Jesus had. I mean, if we want the people around us, all the people around us, not just the people we like or the people who are like us, if we want the people around us to experience the love of Jesus, we've got to have that same kind of multi-directional love. Heaven and hell hangs in the balance for us and for the people around us based on what we choose to do with the love that we've received. God so loves you. God so loves us. God so loves the world. And if God so loves us, then we also ought to love one another. I want to pray for us this morning. So I want to invite you, if you will, to close your eyes and, and take a deep breath. Right now, I know that there are people who can hear the sound of my voice. And the notion that God could possibly love you is a foreign notion to you. And right now, we want to pray for you that you would experience the full love of God. And right now, I, I have a hunch that there might be people who can hear the sound of my voice. And, and maybe you feel like God is, maybe God's nudging you toward a particular person. Maybe God's nudging you toward a particular situation. Maybe God's nudging you toward a particular group of people. And you're realizing right now in this moment that God's calling you not just to receive his love, but to share it. So I want to ask, I want to ask you, wherever you are, whether you're in your, in your living room or you're with a group, I want to ask you to pray this prayer with me. You can pray it in your heart. You can pray it out loud. But I want to ask you to pray this prayer. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I love you. I love you with all of my heart. I love you with all of my mind. I love you with all of my strength. I love you because you first loved me. And so today, God, I give my heart to you. I give my life to you. I choose today to follow you, today and all of my days. Amen. So we're going to have a time now to pray together and, and to sing together. And so whether you're in your living room or whether you're gathered with some other people, maybe some friends or some neighbors, I want to ask you to pray along. 
or to stand and sing along as, as we sing this song together. And then we're going to come back together in just a minute for a continued time of prayer and communion. They that sing, they that sing, oh, it's like the praying twice, and so we bring a song of love for God. They that sing, oh, it's like the praying twice, and so we bring a song of love for God. Oh.
great thou art How great thou art Then sings my soul My Savior God to So we're now going to share in a time of prayer and communion. Communion is a time when we remember the story of the last night of Jesus' life and his life, death, and resurrection and the significance of that for us. And as I said uh, a few minutes ago, God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We remember that when we share in the story of communion. God's so love. For us. And so on that night, Jesus was with his friends and they were having a meal together. And while the meal was in progress, Jesus took bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, this is my body. It's broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took a cup and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take and drink from this, all of you. This is my blood. It's poured out for you and for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So if you're in a gathering or or if you're at home and you want to share in communion, you can take some bread, just ordinary bread and a cup of juice. You can break off a piece of bread and you can you can say out loud or think to yourself, this is the body of Christ and it's broken for you. And you can dip it in the cup and you can you can say or think, and this is the blood of Christ poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. And it's an opportunity now for us to share in this together. It's a way for us to stay united even while we're separate from one another. The other thing that we want to do right now is we want to pass it off to you for a time of prayer. So if you're gathered with other people, you could share prayer concerns. Maybe maybe move your chairs into a circle wherever it is that you're gathered and go around the circle and ask each other, how can we be praying for you? And when somebody shares a a prayer concern, you could simply say, hey, does anybody feel led to pray right now? And you could stop right then and pray for each other. We want to encourage you to do that. Also want to just ask you, if you would, to be praying for our church today as we're having our groundbreaking celebrations all day long today. And what an exciting time. My prayer for us is that this won't be for us or about us. But this will be an opportunity for us to express the love of God to our community and beyond. And so if you'd be praying for that with us today, that would be amazing. If there's anything that that we can be praying about for you, I'd invite you to put that in the comment thread right now. Or you are always welcome to email me at Travis at the village And I would be honored to be praying for you during this time as well. So I want to pray for us and open us up as we go into this time of prayer and communion. Let's pray together. God. We love you because you have so loved us. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your love. God, right now, as some of us are gathering and sharing in communion, I pray uh, just through the power of your Holy Spirit that you would be at work, that you'd be at work through these gifts of, of bread and the cup, that you would make them be for us the body and blood of Christ so that we can be the body of Christ to the world. God, as we're gathered in separate places, I pray that through the power of your spirit, you would unite us with you, make us one with you, that you would unite us with each other, that you would unite us in in ministry to all the world as we seek to be the hands and feet of Jesus in the world around us. And God, as we're gathered right now in a variety of places, I simply pray that you would hear us now in these moments as we continue to pray.
Hey there, thanks so much for joining us today. If you're on YouTube, we want to encourage you to hit the subscribe button and click that bell icon so that you don't miss a thing coming up here at The Village. Be sure to also head over to thevillagenashville.com so that you can learn more about our church, get connected to a community of people following Jesus together, and learn how you can support the ministries of this church financially. We hope you have a great week.